underlined and bolded and made enormous key member of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. So Sarah is um, a part of the observing staff for the EHT campaign. She's a core contributor to the data processing effort, the calibration and polarimetric analysis pipelines, um, and also to the imaging efforts. So many of those um, incredible images that you've seen um, for M87 um, really have their origin in some of the fantastic work that Sarah has done within the collaboration. She's also a co-lead of one of the four imaging teams, and she'll probably talk with us about that a bit today, but the imaging effort for Sajay Star is also really a substantial, um, just a substantial set of advances for understanding how to do very long baseline interferometry. Um, Sarah did her uh, bachelor's degree in physics with a minor in economics actually right here at McGill. And so this is one of our own fabulous alumna. Um, it's really a joy in that way as well. To uh, welcome Sarah back today. She did a master's degree in astrophysics at um, Radboud University in the Netherlands. Um, she was a visiting postdoctoral fellow for a little while at Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics working there with Michael Johnson. Um, and she's now just about to complete her PhD in astrophysics, again at Redmond in the Netherlands, um, working together with Heino Falke and many other members of the Event Horizon Telescope collaboration. Uh, Sarah has been the recipient of a number of different awards um, for outstanding contributions as a PhD candidate and for a fantastic um, master's degree thesis, etc. cetera. Um, she also has a very interesting and varied background of her own. She was born in Algeria, um, raised in part here in Montreal, um, and then also spent quite a bit of time um, in her life in the Netherlands. And so, Sarah, thank you so much for being with us today and for live streaming and for joining us in this remote seminar environment. And um, take it away, Sarah's gonna be talking about the size, shape, and scattering of the black hole Sagittarius A star. Thank you very much, Daryl. And thank you for the invitation to come back to um, Miguel and give a seminar. So as Daryl mentioned, I'm a member of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. I won't spend too much um, of my talk to talk about uh, talking about the EHT work, but I like to use it to put my work into context. So the EHT is, of course, um, a very global and diverse collaboration made up of over 300 members across multiple institutes and countries around the world. The Event Horizon Telescope collaboration has three principal goals, um, uh, scientific goals we want to achieve. The first is to test theories of gravity in the vicinity of the supermassive black hole. And we also want to connect horizon scale physics to launching mechanisms of relativistic jets um, from supermassive black holes, and then connect horizon scale physics and dynamics to multi-wavelength variability in flares that is um, observed by other, um, at a, other observing wavelengths like X-ray and infrared. So you probably remember this movie um, made by ESO for a big um, result on M87. So M87 is a galaxy about 55 million light years away from us. And it ejects this um, jet of matter of plasma that can be seen in multiple wavelengths in the optical and radio. So as we um, create interferometers that are um, bigger and bigger and at higher and higher frequency, we can zoom in and follow this jet all the way down so as we go to higher and higher frequency, the jet becomes optically thin, and then we can zoom in all the way to its core. Um, and then at 230 gigahertz, the EHT managed to capture the first image of a black hole, the black hole at the center of this galaxy, M87. Now you'll notice that this image only has the donut, as um, the public calls it, and we don't actually see the jet. The reason for that is because our dynamic range, um, the range of um, flux we see with EHT is actually pretty low. So you're probably familiar with the Event Horizon Telescope. Our 2017 observations that created this famous image of a black hole um, consisted of uh, eight different stations, uh, except the SPT, the South Pole Telescope, did not take part in M87 observations because it lies in the Southern Hemisphere and M87 is a Northern Hemisphere source. So this is our 2017 array. But what's not so well known is that we actually have a multitude of uh, multi-wavelength observatories also taking part in our EHT observations. Um, not always simultaneously, but very near in time. So for example, we have lots of high energy monitoring, we have X-ray, we have infrared, we have uh, a broadband radio at lower frequencies. So what I want to focus on a little bit more is this multi-wavelength um, portion in the, uh, in the radio band. So 
radio wavelengths that are not quite EHT, but that do teach us a lot about our sources. So um, our EHT results showed this beautiful image and then a replication, um, theoretical replication by a general relativistic magnetohydrodynamic simulations via our simulation and theory group. So it turns out our modeling is actually pretty good because this um, feature, this uh, black hole shadow is really, really robust and just a direct you know, impact of just light orbiting in, in curved space time. And so whatever we do with our simulations, we would get this shadow out. But the properties of the gas around it is actually still a mystery. Um, so although we are able to replicate nature, there are actually many, many different models that are able to replicate nature. And so how do we decide which one is correct? Um, that's a difficulty we have. So this shadow image of a shadow um, that we got, we were able to measure it and measure a diameter of about 42 microarc seconds. Um, knowing the distance to M87, which is again, has some uncertainty, we obtained a mass of the black hole, which is about six and a half billion solar masses. Now this mass still has some uncertainty to it. Um, the uncertainty is in two parts. First, there is an uncertainty in the distance to the black hole then there is an uncertainty of this uh, emission model, this gas around the black hole, which is, you know, which can be produced by lots of very different mechanisms. And um, we just calibrated against all our multitudes of, of um, simulations to obtain a kind of uncertainty in this mass based on the simulations. So, um, so how do we again? Uh, get more certainty on what the shadow should look like? How do we uh, reduce our uncertainty in our measurements? Then um, one of the goals of the EHT is to test theories of gravity. So what does GR actually predict? So of course, general relativ uh, relativity predicts a very circular shadow. Um, it only deviates to about 4% for a very highly spinning black hole. For M87, because we don't know very clearly its emission mechanism, we don't have a good handle on the spin. We were able to tell that the black hole is actually spinning um, because a non-spinning black hole wouldn't be able to boost out this jet that we see at other frequencies. But um, we weren't able to pinpoint what the number of the spin is because of this uncertainty. So what we could tell was just that it's circular to within 10%. So how do we lower this number? So imagine we have a black hole out there that we know the distance of very precisely, that we know the mass of very precisely. And so we could know exactly what Einstein's theory of general relativity predicts. And then we uh, additionally know its emission mechanism. And then we're able to really test what the theory of gravities um, predict near a black hole and then really um, test them accurately to an image or to our data. So there is a black hole that is actually much better for these kinds of tests than M87, and that is Sagittarius A star. The great thing about Sagittarius A star, the black hole at the center of our galaxy, is that we know it's nice and distance really precisely. And this is thanks to this amazing um, stellar orbits work done by the Keck UCLA group and the gravity uh, collaboration most recently. So the mass and distance are known very accurately, but unfortunately its emission mechanism and its orientation is not really well known. What we expect from Sagittarius A star, what Einstein's theory of relativity predicts is that we should get a shadow of about 50 microarc seconds, but we don't know its orientation and we don't know if it's spinning. So for M87, we did know its orientation because it had a jet. And we know the orientation of the jet and we could tell kind of the orientation of the central black hole. For SETI star, we don't know if it has a jet and we don't know what the emission mechanism is. So we don't know what the orientation is and what the spin could be. So how do we answer these questions to get to testing GR for Sagittarius A star? And really hone down on what we should expect for the Event Horizon Telescope. So let's look at the uh, spectral energy distribution for a Sag A star. This is what it looks like, this spectral energy versus frequency. And these are the radio millimeter um, observations and these are in the infrared. You can see this kind of slope here. 
the slope um, means that there is optically thick emission here, and then there is a bump here where it becomes optically thin. The regime at which the EHT observes is around here just before this bump. And um, what this slope actually tells us is that there has to be some kind of optically thick emission that extends in the low frequency radio. And this can only be fitted by simulations with a jet, um, but it has never been observed. And so we have no idea where this jet is hiding or if there is a jet or something else could actually predict this kind of emission. So at one millimeter, this is what um, these two different models would look like. A model that is actually dominated uh, by radio emission from the, the accretion disk and a model dominated by the emission from the jet. So 1.3 millimeters, just because we're really in this optically thin regime, we only see really just the shadow and some really bright features. So remember that our dynamic range, the amount of flux we see for the EHT is not very high. So what we would see is actually just the brightest features. So we would see here like a crescent and then this shadow, and we wouldn't really see much of the diffuse flux to tell these two apart. Now say if you could zoom out a little bit to a more optically thicker regime where you'd see more of this kind of outflow emission, then maybe you could tell them apart. And that regime is three and a half millimeters or 86 gigahertz in frequency. So at 86 gigahertz or 3.5 millimeters, we actually see accretion flow differences. You can see the accretion disk is actually more puffy and round and the jet dominated is really booming and um, asymmetrical. So if you could look at three millimeters, you could actually tell them apart um, if you could image them. And then unfortunately, as you go to longer and longer wavelengths, it becomes very hard to simulate them in the realm of GRMHD simulation. And three millimeters can be simulated in, in those simulations pretty accurately. Now, unfortunately, we have yet another hurdle and that is interstellar scattering. Because we're looking through to the galactic center, there is actually an interstellar medium between us and the galactic center that contaminates our images of Sagittarius A star. And this interstellar scattering becomes stronger with increasing wavelengths. So at long wavelengths, it's very strong. And as you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths, it becomes weaker and weaker. So at 3.5 millimeters, this is what the two models would look like. We're back to square one. We have no idea which is which. So now it's gonna be very difficult to tell them apart. But what if we could actually study the scattering and understand it and actually just remove it? Then that would actually help us um, to to remove the contaminations from scattering and obtain the true intrinsic image that lies behind this screen. So what we know about the scattering model so far is that the scattered size scales as lambda squared. As we go to um, uh, various frequencies, you can see this um, scaling over here. This is the size of the source versus wavelength in centimeters. And at, in the low frequency or, or long wavelength regime, the scattering is really what's dominating the observed size. The source behind it is actually pretty small, but the scattering takes most of the image and it blurs the image significantly and stretches it predominantly in the east-west. Um, then once we reach about the 3.5 millimeter regime over here, the intrinsic size becomes actually comparable to this blurring kernel, this, this um, blurring thing that stretches it east-west. So suddenly we reach a point where the scattering is actually just as much as the intrinsic source. So we can actually start to separate them. And then as you go to lower, um, wave, uh, shorter wavelengths at 1.3 millimeters, for example, the intrinsic size dominates. This is where we got uh, these amazing historical 2013 EHT detections where we detected um, the source on very, very long baselines, you know, very high resolution um, we find these finer features because they were not completely blurred out um, by the scattering. Now, another thing we know about the scattering is we have refractive substructure at 1.3 centimeters in the longer wavelengths. It was found that there is structure in the scattering screen that actually causes this kind of spurious signal, this fine structure on these long baselines, this finer resolution um, detections. So we don't know what this um, refractive substructure looks like in the, in the millimeter wave. 
So how would this look like at shorter wavelengths? How does this refractive noise or refractive substructure affect our one millimeter images? Let me show you a little glimpse of that. So depending on the scattering theory or scattering model, this, um, this refractive scattering may actually contaminate tests of GR with EHT images. So it's actually a pretty worrying effect for the EHT. So say we have a simple ring at 1.3 millimeters that we observe. This is unscattered. Then we have these two models, one that I call J18 by Johnson et al. 2018, one that I call GSO6 by Goldreich and Schurdhard uh, 2006. Now these two models have the same kind of blurring, but they have different refractive scattering, different substructure. And the substructure varies differently with frequency for these two. So let's scatter this ring with each model. So I scatter it with the J18 model. It looks like this. So you can see that the ring is actually more blurred out in the east-west. The top and bottom parts are sharper because they're not as blurred. And then there's this kind of finer substructure, this kind of frosted glass on top of it that is the refractive um, substructure. And it's quite low. Um, they're kind of small um, levels of this uh, finer noise. Now the GSO6 model would look like this. And so um, you can see again, the top and bottom are brighter because there's more blurring in the east-west, but the refractive substructure is very, very strong. And you can actually lose almost all sight of the ring. So if this GSO6 model is right, it leaves very little hope for our tests of GR with the EHT. And unfortunately, both these scattering models actually fit observational constraints up until 2017. So what do they look like at 3.5 millimeters? So although they vary with frequency and in the centimeter regime, they look the same, at 3.5 millimeters, they also look different, just like the EHT. So they both have the same kind of diffractive blurring, this blurring to the east-west, but they have different refractive noise, refractive scattering. And it would look like this. So you can see the J18 model has a very low level of this kind of um, um, blurring, this substructure. And the GSO6 model has these very strong ones. So imagine we had an array that was big enough and sensitive enough that it could have long baselines to get very high resolution detections of these tiny, tiny features in the scattering screen. Then if you could detect these tiny features, you could actually compare the expected level for these two models and actually tell which one is right. And we weren't able to do that until 2017. So what does Sagittarius A star look like at 86 gigahertz? So before 2017, we had no baselines that were above about a giga lambda, um, which, is, um, which is where the source still looks Gaussian. So we always observe this kind of scattered source that looks Gaussian and uh, is blurred and stretched in the east-west. So we need these longer baselines, this higher resolution to probe possible non-Gaussian structure. So this is a nice schematic um, that shows what the uh, amplitude of the function of projected baseline length, so basically telescope spacing, would look like for these three different images. These three images have the same size on the sky, um, the same full with half max, I would say. So if you plot them on this kind of plot, you'll see that they all kind of look the same. They follow this Gaussian fall off up until a certain point, and then they deviate because you start to probe the finer structure in the image. So the Gaussian, of course, goes flat, and then the crescent um, has a strong asymmetry over here, and the GRMHD1 has this ringing. Um, so if we could get into this regime where we could actually pick up on small structure, then um, we could actually tell apart you know, either non-Gaussian structure in the source or properties of this refractive scattering that may be pretty devastating for the EHT. So Sorry, before you move on, could yeah. we go to the chat for a few clarifying questions? Yes, let's go. Yes, so Jim Klein asks, uh, what is the difference between orientation and spin direction, if any? Or, so orientation is um, with respect to the observer, right? And the spin direction is the spin axis. So uh, for M87, which I guess I can show, uh, for M87, the orientation of the black hole 
with respect to the observer, to us, is 17 degrees. Um, because we know that is the orientation, that is the angle of the jet. And that is calculated by looking at jet components moving outward. And so we know the angle from these um, lower frequency observations of the jet. The spin axis of the, uh, of the black hole is actually into the board. It's into the board and the black hole is spinning clockwise. Um, that is found by our tests of GRMHD simulations. So they are different uh, quantities. And for Sagittarius A, uh, the orientation would be defined by the accretion disk since there's no jets, right? We, yeah, we don't know if there is a jet. Um, so again, the lower frequency part of the spectral energy distribution uh, is very hard to explain without a jet component. And so um, there's still evidence that there is a jet, but it's never been seen. And so that is the tricky part. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and so while you're there, um, Jim's other question was, you know, it should, uh, is the accretion disk not expected to correlate with the black hole spin? Well, I think she already answered that. Yeah, OK. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, the, so the, the accretion disk normally does not, uh, does not have to lie with the black hole spin. Uh, it really depends on how the infalling material goes onto, onto the disk. And it doesn't really have to be aligned with the black hole. But the gas closest to the black hole always rotates with the black hole. And so what we see here, this kind of halo of gas, will always rotate with the black hole, and they both rotate clockwise. Further out, we don't know. It's okay, not so necessarily, yeah. Getting back to the scattering, um, Daniele asks, uh, why the strong scattering uh, that's expected for Sagittarius A star, why is that not observed in M87? Um, so in M87, there is scattering, but it's about a thousand times weaker. Um, just because I think we're looking through uh, the galaxy and we don't have this kind of impeding medium in between. Um, so if it's a thousand times weaker, we usually just ignore it. Um, and there's always scattering everywhere. Um, there's gas or ionized gas. But for a star, there's actually a specific scattering screen or kind of a cloud region in between us and the galactic center. And it's been kind of positioned um, to be, I think, five kiloparsecs uh, away from us, um, between us and the galactic center by a pulsar um, magnetar observations. And that, that uh, screen is, is incredibly dense and is really um, very much stronger than what we see in M87. Um, one more before you go on from Daryl, um, and she says you may get to this, so feel free to to wait until later. But she's wondering whether we can tell if the sc which scattering model fits best, and whether there's a jet using the three point five millimeter observations, or if one uh, confounds the other. Yes, we can do both. Yes. Um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about that in the next part. Yeah. Great. Um, is there, are there more questions? We are all caught up, caught up for now. Okay. Um, okay, so let me introduce uh, the Global Millimeter VLBI Array, or GMVA. The GMVA is basically like an EHT array, but um, at three millimeters instead of one millimeter. Uh, it uses some of the same stations as the EHT. It has some European uh, stations, the Very Long Baseline Array in the US, the Green Bank Telescope in the US. So that's the VLBA here, that's the GBT, and that's ALMA. And ALMA was first equipped for VLBI by the ALMA phasing project, and it first joined observing um, with the EHT and the GMVA in 2017. And ALMA is really a game changer for north-south coverage and these long intercontinental baselines or antenna pairs. So you can see most of the array was really east-west up until ALMA came, and then we had these booming um, baselines all the way down here. So we observed Sagistar um, at um, three millimeters on April 3rd, 2017, actually two days before our first observation with the EHT. And we observed Sagistar star and two other uh, calibrators and we had eight hours with ALMA, 12 hours total. We had 13 participating stations. Unfortunately, we don't have the amazing bandwidth that we have with the EHT. 
um, but we had full polarization observing and enough to detect some signal. We actually made use of uh, primary EHT pipelines to reduce this data, although it's slightly different. We use data reduction via the EHT hops pipeline that is the primary pipeline for the EHT M87 results. We did some processing checks with the standard VLBI pipeline uh, used in low frequency VLBI. And then we did imaging with the EHT imaging library, which is one of the three softwares that created the M87 image. So after some calibration and, and um, corrections, which I won't bore you with, I'll just reveal um, our amazing amplitude versus baseline length plot. So I'll just walk you a little bit through this. So up until 2017 observations, we've always observed Sagittarius A star to look like a Gaussian. And so we've measured what the major axis and minor axis of that Gaussian looks like. And so its amplitude profile is plotted here in yellow. So this is what's been measured before 2017. We thought, oh, it's a Gaussian. And then this is what the Gaussian would look like. This is the minor axis. Uh, amplitude as a function of baseline length or antenna spacing. Um, and then this is what the major axis fall off looks like. Um, and before 2017, um, we basically only had about these kinds of detections. Everything after this is all to ALMA and is completely new in our 2017 observation. So what does this actually tell us? The first big thing is these yellow or orangey kind of dots. This is our baseline ALMA to Green Bank telescope. ALMA was a, a kind of phased array of 35 dishes, 35 12 meter dishes, making a 70 meter extremely sensitive dish. And the Green Bank telescope is a 100 meter dish. And so they're both extremely sensitive and giving us very, very high signal to noise detections. You can't even see the error bars on this plot. That's how high uh, SNR they are. And so what this tells us is that this baseline should actually see the minor axis of the source, but it actually lies above what we would expect for a Gaussian. So this baseline actually tells us that the source is not Gaussian, the source on the sky. Um, so that's already a really exciting result that we didn't have before. Another thing is these detections over here, which are a very, very long baseline. They kind of seem to plateau, kind of. These detections, if we were to compare them to the level of refractive scattering we would expect for these two models. This is where the GSO6 model would like that one very horrible model. This is what it predicts the level of scattering it predicts for, for three millimeter. And the J18 model predicts this level here. And you can see our detections lie pretty low. And this is extremely, uh, um, a, a huge relief really <laughs> to be working on EHT and find this result. Because all the detections at three millimeter actually ruled out the GSO6 scattering model for Saudi star. And it's really encouraging for EHT science. And, and this model turned out to be a really good fit for um, or predict really well what the, uh, the results were. So we actually used this scattering model to remove the scattering, this frosted glass, and get an intrinsic image. So how do we do that? We want to get an unscattered image. Um, of Sagittarius A star. So there's a tool developed by Michael Johnson called Stochastic Optics. So it uses, um, so it's a similar technique to adaptive optics, but we can do it in post-processing. So say we have some GRMHD simulation here and we scatter it with a scattering model, this J18 model. So it first gets this diffractive blurring, mostly stretched in the east-west, and then it gets this refractive noise that has this ripples um, of substructure on top of it. Now, what we do is we actually um, model uh, within the imaging algorithm, this non-Gaussian kernel, uh, and then this stochastically varying uh, noise substructure. We solve for these variations in the screen in the form of this phase screen here. And then um, once that's solved and removed, we deconvolve with the scattering kernel to get an unscattered image. And this is all done within the EHT imaging library package. So these are our results. This is our scattered image, which is stretched in the east-west here. And this is our unscattered image, which looks pretty symmetrical. All our closure phases in the data, which are um, robust to station issues, actually are consistent with zero. And closure phases actually tell us about the level of asymmetry. So 
Zero closure phase means symmetrical source. Non-zero closure phase means asymmetrical. So we detected no apparent asymmetry in the image. And the morphology is actually pretty symmetrical. So we found that the emission at 86 gigahertz, or 30, uh, 3 millimeters, originates within 12 Schwarzschild radii of the black hole. And um, this is actually pretty close to um, the event horizon or the regime uh, observed by the EHT, which is about two to five short shield radii. Then we tested um, the shape of our, um, of our image against GRMHD simulations. So we took GRMHD simulations and we sampled this kind of disk models that are more symmetrical and jet models, which are more elongated and we vary different aspects like electron um, and acceleration. And uh, we did the same scattering with the uh, stochastic optics tool. And then we imaged um, these kind of simulated data with, this, uh, with the identical pipeline used for real star J star. So these are the models we, we used, or some of them. Um, this is a disk model that is about 60 degrees inclined. This is a jet model that is five degrees inclined. So we're basically looking at it almost face on. Um, this is a 90 degree jet, so it's edge on. And this is another 90 degree jet with accelerated particles. So it's a little bit more puffy. So we um, scattered it with this J18 model and then we've reconstructed an observed scattered image and then an intrinsic image. And you'll notice that the intrinsic images you know, still recover the asymmetry from the original model. These two look fairly um, symmetrical, and then the jet models come out pretty elongated. So these te so we tested these um, against you know, eight different simulations. We looked at electron acceleration in disks and jets, and we also looked at different electron heating prescription and spin for the black hole. What we found is that if the emission mechanism is actually jet dominated, the emission must be face on. So it has to be less than 20 degrees. So anything over 20 degrees does not match the um, symmetry found for our image. So then we wanted to follow up a little bit in 2018 and see if these features we found in our image, this um, non-Gaussian um, property and also this refractive scattering bubble, whether it was actually robust um, and not just one you know, statistical fluke, um, because of course the, the scattering screen st varies stochastically. And so you may have low instances of noise. So we observed again in 2018 with GMV plus alma, and we had two observations to explore properties of the scattering. So the first one was April 14, second one, April 17. Uh, unfortunately on April 17, we lost the GBT, which cost us our long baseline detections Nevertheless, April 14 has enough information to tell. So these are our results, uh, which will be published pretty soon. Um, these, um, again, it's the same kind of plot. The major and minor axis for the Gaussian is again shown in these white lines. And then we have our three observations. In white is our 2017 one, which I showed earlier. In yellow is 14 April 2018, and in blue 17 April 2018. And then the levels for GSO6 and J18 are shown. So here's ALMA GBT again. You'll see that our observations in 2018 lie along the same trend as our 2017 ones. And so once again, ALMA GBT is non Gaussian structure for SAG A star. So this is definitely robust and a property of the source. And then the low um, refractive detections on long baselines again lie pretty low and consistent with the J18 model, which again, adds um, even more uh, certainty that the GSO6 model is definitely not right. So in the future, we want to expand GMV April Salma to more stations. So we'd like to um, equip uh, high sensitivity stations within the EHT as part of the NGEHT initiative um, to um, observe at three millimeters, which would enable making use also of the EHT um, high, uh, high bandwidth backends. So we can record um, more data and have higher SNR detections of our source. Um, we want to increase our um, sensitivity in the east-west direction um, to uh, sensitive stations. And we want to do more closure um, analysis to look for time domain signals. Because in the accretion flow, 
we would expect you know uh, possible periodic signals or um, correlations with you know flares uh, flaring events we see inside a star and also um, 12 short shield radii which is what we measure um, is also the regime of where gravity observes its flares for example it's about 10 to 12 short shield radii and so that gives us a very interesting overlap between what we see at three millimeters um, with the GMB plus ALMA and what gravity sees in the infrared um, in terms of you know this kind of uh, interaction of flares uh, and radio emission near the black hole. So, Sarah, um, before you move on, uh, we have a yeah. few more questions um, that I think might be good to hit before we continue. Uh, the first is from. Two slides left. <laughs> oh, really? Um, yeah. Okay, well, maybe we should just hold off until the end and then we can circle back to the questions then. Yeah. All right, thanks. Okay, um, so I was just going to finish off and say that, um, you know, as we zoom into Sagittarius, they start with the EHT, um, we can expect more overlap with gravity and add an additional building block to understanding the, the emission model for Sagittarius star and its inclination, which we can rule out at three millimeters. Um, and in addition to what we can do at, um, for the emission model, we can also um, probe the interstellar scattering and um, add it to uh, our knowledge for EHT imaging and analysis. So 86 gigahertz is actually a key building point to understanding uh, our EHT data, understanding our EHT images, and actually modeling accurately um, the, the um, GR effects and shadow shape of the black hole um, once we do obtain you know, um, good enough images with the EHT. So just to summarize a little bit my results, um, the size that we found for Sagittarius A star, the radio emission is at 86 gigahertz originates within a compact region of about 12 short shield radii. As I said, this is about the regime that is observed with gravity and not too far away from what we would see with the EHT at the more optically thin um, regime at one millimeter. Then the shape, we obtain a highly symmetrical morphology. So we were actually able to rule out highly asymmetrical looking sources, which are um, these elongated jet dominated models at high inclination. Um, so these could not fit our three millimeter observations unless there are actually less than 20 degrees of face on. And this is actually interestingly consistent with the latest gravity collaboration flare results where they found also a kind of um, ploidal magnetic field configuration and um, think less than 30 degree inclination for um, the black hole system. Then the scattering, we were able to actually rule out this GSO6 model, um, which overestimated the flux that we would see on these, on these long baselines, on these um, high spacings. And that was successfully uh, ruled out both by our 2017 and 2018 results. And the J18 model actually uh, passed for both observations. And this gives us really good prospects for understanding our uh, interstellar scattering for um, images with the Event Horizon Telescope and also less contamination of our images for tests of general relativity. So that's where my talk ends. I'll take more questions. Thanks very much, that's great. Um, so maybe because we're at the end, um, instead of just reading you everyone's questions, I could have people unmute themselves uh, and ask for themselves. So, so John, do you want to ask your question first? Uh, sure. So um, you were showing some uh, GRMHD simulations that you compared your observations to. Um, I was just wondering, are those uh, images from those simulations that you showed, um, do those simulations have radiative transfer? Are, are, are those images uh, from the simulations from radiative transfer? Yes, yes. So these are uh, GRMHD um, simulations that were um, that were traced by a general relativistic. Um, uh, does it have radiative transfer? No, I don't think they do. Ah, uh, okay, cool. Thank you. I think they're they're just uh, ray traced. Yeah, I'll have to think. I'm not a theory person, so I have to think about this. No worries. Thank you. Um, Adrian, do you want to ask your question about the stochastic deconvolution? Sure. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. 
Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to hear a little bit more about the stochastic deconvolution technique. Can you just say a little bit more? I'm kind of interested in, you know, how you mentioned um, there's this, uh, the, um, the, the modeling that goes on there, right? Um, the, so like how many, like, do you have knobs that you can turn in terms of this deconvolution process and for the, are you introducing lots more degrees of freedom? Like how, how does that work? Yeah, so it, it does introduce um, more degrees of freedom in terms of these knobs. So this is a um, regularized maximum likelihood method that we use in EHT imaging. And so we try to minimize uh, um, data and regularize or these kind of functions, uh, chi-squares um, by a gradient descent. And so for this modeling, um, there is actually a significant um, amount of background information put into the model where we actually fix the properties of the non-Gaussian kernel based on low frequency observations. We also fix the power spectrum for these stochastically varying uh, variations or a substructure on top of it. And then we try to um, fit a fitting face screen for, for these variations and the, the um, intrinsic source simultaneously. Okay, thanks, that, that, that's helpful, thanks. Okay, so we're caught up on questions from uh, the chat and from Slack. So if uh, folks have additional questions, feel free to, to unmute yourself or raise your hand and ask them now. So this is Daryl, can I ask you a question? Yeah, go ahead, Daryl. Oh, super, thanks. Um, so Sarah, you and I actually chatted about this a little bit today, um, but I'm wondering if you wanted to really push on this, sort of the leverage that you're getting out of three and a half millimeters, what is it that you need to kind of like push this to the next level? Do you need more baselines? Do you need, um, yeah, what is it that will make this really kind of, you know, even more spectacular than it already is? So I think in terms of baselines, we do have a lot of stations. I think right now, contrary to the EHT, we're not really coverage limited, we're really sensitivity limited. So increasing our recording bandwidth or adding uh, more sensitive stations would make a big difference, especially because right now we've had uh, zero um, you know, VLBI detections at three millimeters and polarization. Um, and so higher sensitivity means higher SNR and higher um, possibility of detecting low levels of polarization. And if you could do polarization mapping as well in the accretion flow of Sagittarius A star, that would definitely um, help us rule out a lot more models because um, even though um, many models can produce the same um, sort of total intensity of radio uh, emission, they could look pretty different in polarization. And that's something that we've also found for modeling of M87. So that would make a big difference in discriminating models and really honing down into this emission mechanism. So um, after our 2018 observations, the VLB actually doubled its bandwidth, but unfortunately um, we never got the opportunity to observe with them with that setup. Um, so there will be some opportunity to do that in the near future and hopefully get um, possibly some potential um, you know, stronger detections and maybe polarization to try to further this work. Okay, I was gonna follow that up by asking whether or not the technology, the sort of instrumentation to get that sensitivity, that bump in sensitivity already exists, but it sounds like it does. It's not a huge instrumentation development. It's just getting to use the telescopes that already have the instruments on them that you need right now. Yes, so um, the, the little hiccup at three millimeters is that the, the short baselines, which give us you know, the large scale structure um, are entirely VLBA. And so that depends on the funding of the NREO, which operates the VLBA. And I think um, it's not really at the stage where it can really boost up that much higher. It took 20 years just to double the bandwidth um, to you know, 500 megahertz. Um, so the alternative, which um, I've been pushing for in the NGHT is to really equip 
our EHT stations and maybe our NDHT stations, which will be a little bit more, there'll be more of them and smaller dishes with three millimeter receivers. And that way we can make use of our EHT equipment, which have really high um, bandwidth uh, recording and observe at three millimeters and actually you know, fully leverage this amount of science that we can do at, at three millimeters. And I think it's a really interesting regime to be looking at lots of stuff for Sagittarius C star for interstellar scattering. And it ties in so well with, you know, other multi wavelength efforts that look at flares um, in, in that region and also feeds in really well with what we're trying to do with the EHT. So very fundamental science. Um, so it will be the perfect place to start pushing for, you know, these kind of um, equipment of these stations. Awesome, thanks. More questions for Sarah? We have a few more minutes. I'm happy to answer questions about EHT too. It doesn't have to be about Saji Star. Except, yeah, I can't reveal anything about Saji Star EHT. I think that's a given. Uh, well, on that note, are you allowed to say when we might hear from <laughs> EHT Sag Star? Uh, it, it's kind of hard to say. We're working very hard on it. I think uh, we're closer to it than we were before. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know when. I think if not at the end of this year, it will be next year. Great. Yeah. Thanks. And sorry if that was an irritating question. <laughs> no, not at all. I, I understand the, the interest and, and we really want to get it out as soon as possible too. It's just, it's an incredibly difficult source. And I think our, even our most sophisticated tools are really being put to the test. And we really want to make sure that um, we understand these new tools that we developed really well before we put something out there that you know, may not be, yeah, that we're not 100% sure of. I think, yeah, we really want to be sure that we have a really good product um, to bring out, but it's coming. Definitely. Thank you. So Sarah, I have another quick question that since you focused a lot on Sag A star um, in this talk, what do you think the sort of the next most exciting thing you talked about Jess at the beginning um, for M87, which is the other horizon um, scale target for, for EHD and potentially for these three and a half millimeter or three millimeter observations. Um, so what do you think the sort of next exciting discoveries or, or you know, questions are for M87? Yeah, so for M87, um, so our 2017 observations were actually full polarization and we've only published total intensity. So we're working hard right now on the polarization results for M87. And like I said um, before, um, even though lots of different GRMHD models can produce the same total intensity emission, they look very different in polarization. So polarization maps of M87 would really help us understand way better the magnetic field configuration around the black hole rule out more models and actually connect to this magnetic field configuration to uh, jet launching um, of this you know, big uh, radio jet we see in M87. And that's super exciting. I think that's what's coming up. At three millimeters, um, what's interesting about M87 is that if we had the resolution at three millimeters, there are actually some models that predict that we could see a shadow at three millimeters. And um, it would, you know, expanding a three millimeter array to get that kind of re resolution is not trivial, but we could potentially see a shadow at 86 gigahertz or three millimeters um, um, of M87, depending on the emission mechanism. So there too, three millimeter science would help us kind of hone down on the true uh, emission and jet mechanism for M87. That will be pretty exciting. Um, there's of course the prospects of NGHT, which is to increase uh, our coverage for the source and actually image the jet um, uh, in our EHT images. 
as I said at the beginning, you only see kind of the, the bright ring and the shadow. We don't have the dynamic range to see the jet. But if we add you know, more and more stations closer together, we'd be able to capture this large scale structure and actually image the jet as part of our EHT images. And that will help us connect a lot better the, the black hole shadow and the jet emission with um, the, the lower frequency um, uh, radio images that we see of the jet. I think that would make a kind of more direct connection of EHT results to the multi-wavelength um, efforts going on with MID7. Lots of exciting stuff coming up. Yeah, very nice. Thanks. It's exciting for sure. Okay, we are coming up on the end of the hour, but if there are any last questions, we have another minute. Um, if not, the Slack channel will stay open. So if you think of questions later, um, feel free to, to ask those there. We can keep the conversation going a little bit. Um, but if there are no final questions, um, let's all thank Sarah uh, for a very interesting talk. Um, thanks, Sarah, that was awesome. Thank you.